Good afternoon. Welcome to our show. I'm your host, Melissa Ridgen. Tis the season to be jolly, so we're going to switch gears a little bit here, taking a break from some of the tougher issues that we cover throughout the year, and instead putting good holiday vibes in focus. We've got Murray Porter performing. We've got incredible beadwork that's gained international attention. Uh, how we remember our loved ones at this time of year who have moved on to the spirit world. Uh, a Métis family whose Christmas wish came a little early when they got word that they'll be on a game show. And a one-horse open sleigh that could be pulled by Lac La Croix ponies, a.k.a. the Ojibwe ponies. It's kind of been a bit of a Christmas miracle. Maybe not this Christmas, but Christmas is in the past. They've been saved from the brink of extinction. It's a Christmassy goodie bag for you today here on In Focus. Our phone lines are open. You can call in and wish a loved one Merry Christmas, or you could say hi from your community. Uh, or if you've got a little one who wants to make a wish to Santa, Santa is an In Focus fan. He's always watching. You can share your wish right down this number. It's toll free 1 877 647 2786. It'll pop up throughout the show, too. Uh, or you can tweet us at APTN In Focus. Our first guests got an early Christmas gift when they found out that they're going to compete on Canada's Family Feud, a new uh, game show that debuted this week. Alicia Perot Werner shared on social media that her family is, who's made tea, they're from St. Albert, Alberta. They will be donning their sashes and they will be doing the Red River Jig on the show when they compete next month. I got to talk to the family earlier this week. Take a look. Hello, thank you, Métis Wolfpack of St. Albert, for joining us today. I have so many questions. How did this, how did this come to be, this, uh, you guys going on this, the Family Feud Canada game show? So it first started with a Facebook post that Family Feud Canada posted on Facebook. We saw the call for auditions in July, and as soon as I saw it on Facebook, I knew who my Métis Wolfpack were and who I wanted to be on my team. So two days later, everybody gathered at my house, and we put an audition tape together and submitted it right away to Family Feud. And what was, what was on your audition tape, and, and what were they looking for, I guess? So we did a little bit of introductions of each one of us, and then Eileen's son, Max Hartman, he was our host for the show, and he asked us, we did a mock round, and asked questions, and we nailed it, of course, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> and uh, after the fake round of Family Feud, we did some jigging. You can't, can't be the Métis Wolfpack without some jigging. Obviously, and were you guys wearing your sashes too, I hope? We were yep. wearing our sashes, you bet. Nice. So did, when they phoned you, when did you find out that you would be on the, on the game show? Two so, yeah, ago? they called us November 22nd. Not that that, memory's, that, that date's burned in my memory, <laughs> but it is November 22nd. Mm -hmm. I got the call at work and was screaming like a crazy person in my office. People thought somebody died, something was going on. So I kept it a secret, though, for 24 hours, got my family together, told them, okay, guys, we're getting together. We're going to have a fake. I told them we we're going to audition again for the producers uh -huh. and didn't want to wanted to tell everybody together and give the news as one whole group. So they came and boom. Uh -huh. And we so, based on Auntie Sandy and too for everything. Yes. Uh, did they say what was it about your audition tape that they went, yeah, these are people we need on our show? She said we were just super exciting. I think um, the diversity that we bring to the show, the Métis angle is definitely, I think, has caught their eye. Um, but we're really wild and crazy when you get us together. You can't contain the five of us. So <laughs> I think the screams, the laughing, the jigging just stood out. And when you go on, so when does this show tape? It's, it's in the new year, in January, is it not? Yep, January 26th, 27th in Toronto. Yep. And what's your, what do you guys plan to do in Toronto? Are the, are the sashes going to be there? Definitely. Sashes are going to be there, absolutely. And um, so we have to coordinate two outfits. And we've been blessed, and we are contacted by a Métis artist, Lisa Shepard, who has kindly offered to provide us with some of her clothing. She does Métis beading and uh -huh. design, so she is uh, sending us some items to wear on the show. So we're super honored and excited about that. Yeah. This is Thankful amazing. Too. And what's, what's, the, what's your game plan? Like, is there a strategy going into Family Feud? Well, we're super competitive, <laughs> crazy competitive people. So our strategy is to win, obviously. We're going the th three shows. We're going the, the whole way. Yeah. Um, but honestly, just have fun and be ourselves, I think. Well, we're PVRing 
yes. every show and trying to compete against the families that are on there. So, of course, it debuts tonight. So we're going to see if we can beat them ourselves. Exactly. <laughs> we all have the app downloaded. We're going, we're going, we're going to town getting ready. That's right. This is amazing. And what, I mean, I guess, what are you going to do if you win the three? Like, you can win the three, win three shows in a row, right? And then you've got to kind of move on. What do you do if you win them all? No, not, not not if we win. When we win. <laughs> when you when win. we win the three episodes. I don't know. Have we thought about it? Well, we're gonna have to party, right? Yeah. 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 We'll do something for the family for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, just get up from Toronto. Get on a direct flight to wherever, so you can have your party. I hear Vegas or maybe Miami. Maybe that's what you do. Sorry, family. Ooh. We're not gonna be home for a couple days. Yes. <laughs> Good plan. Metis Wolfpack go does Vegas. Let's yeah, get I like yeah. it. <laughs> we, would, we would send a camera. Maybe Beverly, a producer here, and I might come and join you down there for that. It sounds like it would be a yes. Hit. We can be honorary Wolfpack members. That's right. Yes. 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 I love it. <laughs> well, I understand you guys are going to give us a little sample of uh, some of the action you're going to share with the Family Feud Canada audience. So take it away. You bet. Let's do it. That's right. Mm. Time to jig, ladies. <laughs> I love that. Okay, just let me get the... You're seeing Albert Métis Wolfpack heading to Family Feud Canada in the new year to represent. Woohoo! Good luck, ladies. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Love those girls. Thanks to our video journalist, Chris Stewart, for making a trek out to St. Albert so we could talk to the wonderful Métis Wolfpack. We will let you know in the new year how they fared on Canada's Family Feud. So what's Christmas without some one horse open sleigh reference? Or a little one who wants Santa to bring a pony for Christmas? Or what about just a Christmas miracle? This next story checks off a couple of those boxes. The Lac La Croix pony, also known as the Ojibwe pony, lived and worked alongside Ojibwe people in northwestern Ontario and Minnesota. But thanks to governments on both sides of the border, they were, they were brought virtually to the point of extinction in the, by the 1970s. They're now on the rebound, and while still classified as criti critically rare, they number around 170, 180 in total, um, they are coming back. Susan Nurberg is a Montreal freelance writer. She told this fascinating story of the Lac La Croix Pony in a recent issue of Broadview Magazine. She now shares that story with In Focus producer Beverly Andrews and all of us. I first learned about these horses uh, through the um, Ontario Parks um, blog and um, Quetico Provincial Park which is located in uh, northwestern Ontario uh, not not that far from Thunder Bay they um, do um, an outreach program every Labor Day weekend with the Ojibwe horses um, the um, owners of Grey Raven Ranch uh, Darcy White Crow and Kimberly Campbell on Seine River First Nation they bring a couple of the horses every um, every year on the Labor Day weekend to let people know about the existence of the horse. And that's where I first um, heard about them. And I was very surprised to learn that Canada had a horse that had been bred by Indigenous people. This was news to me. And when I started um, asking friends and, and people just if they've ever heard about the horse, they all said no. So I thought, hmm, this needs a little investigation. The horses weren't kept how Europeans kept horses. Ojibwe people were um, living in a sort of a symbiotic relationship with this horse. So they were used on, um, on trap lines and to haul wood. They were used to haul blocks of ice out of the lake in winter. Um, and in return, the horse would get fed uh, and cared for and protected from predators. What makes the Ojibwe ponies unique? 
they um, have adapted to their environment in northwestern Ontario, um, which, which is very cold in winter. So one of the features is um, they have an extra nose flap inside, which helps um, the air get warmer before it's um, drawn into the lungs. Uh, they have small, very fuzzy, furry ears uh, that keep the cold out in winter and it also keeps uh, bugs out in, in summer. So it's sort of a protection um, in that environment. And they have very, very hard hooves for running across rock on the Canadian Shield. And um, the body, they, they look like a horse, but the size is that of a pony. So they're adapted to run around in tight boreal forest. The Ontario government relocated Ojibwe communities to make room for the Quatico Provincial Park. And they weren't about to relocate horses too. By the mid-70s, there were only four horses left in existence. So the horses, they lived on both sides of the U.S.-Canada border uh, in uh, northwestern Ontario and uh, Minnesota. And they, uh, on, on the American side, it's a little more clear as to why they were wiped out. They, they were completely wiped out on, on the U.S. side of the border. So in the 1930s um, and 40s, missionaries there uh, felt that it was inappropriate for children to see these horses breed. And um, under that pretext, um, the horses were killed off by uh, the government on government orders. In Canada, it's a, there are more theories as to why they disappeared or almost disappeared. Uh, one is obviously when, when people were removed uh, from towns to, to um, create the park, they no longer had access to the horses, which were feral horses. They lived in the forest and roamed. So are the ponies native to the region? That is an interesting question. Um, elders uh, will say that the horses have always been with them. Uh, of course, the history books tell us that the horse was brought by Europeans after having gone extinct um, in North America um, since the last Ice Age. But there are, um, one of the people I interviewed, uh, her name is Yvette Collin. She is, um, she did her PhD on the indigenous horse across North America. And she, in, in her years of study and interviews with um, indigenous people and scientists, found that it is possible that there were pockets of horses that survived in certain areas. Uh, and that those horses would have existed when settlers arrived uh, and that's why the Ojibwe for instance have such a strong relationship with the horse it's not something you develop overnight it takes um, hundreds and maybe even thousands of years to create such a strong bond and so these these scientists um, are now trying to find out if there is fossil evidence for the horse having existed in North America in certain parts at the time of contact. While that remains up in the air, the fate of the ponies seems more certain. The um, population is slowly growing. It's still uh, an endangered species. There are only about 170 to 180 of these horses in existence uh, today, uh, which is not a lot, but it's certainly better than four in Joining me now is Louise May of Aurora Farm. You have three of these Ojibwe ponies, a couple of them who we saw in that uh, show that we, or the story we just saw from Beverly. Yes, How did you do. come to have Ojibwe ponies? Well, I guess uh, we heard it was two falls ago. We heard of a plight of, of one of the biggest herds in uh, in Ontario was half of them were being auctioned off due to a, a set of circumstances mm -hmm. and um, 
We knew about it only for a short period of time, but that auction is known to attract all the meat horse buyers, you know, who are buying horses for slaughter. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just struck me and others, obviously, because a number of us showed up that day intent on uh, making sure that none of those horses went to slaughter. And that did happen that day. Every one of those 25 horses that was on that chopping block uh, went home to good homes. And um, actually, the miracle is that from that situation of crisis, a whole big group of us have now come to be uh, what we call ourselves as caretakers of the Ojibwe horses. The Ojibwe <coughs> Horse Caretaker Society. That's us. And had you known mm -hmm. of the, I mean, I found that I never, had never heard this before <coughs> until I read the Broadview article that Susan uh, Nurberg did. Mm -hmm. I had never heard anything of this, and then I found it fascinating, and then you start kind of snooping around, and the more you learn, the more fascinating you find it. Did you already have sort of this background knowledge on the Lacroix pony? You know, oddly, as synchronicities happen, uh, in case he's watching, I have a dear friend, Fabian Ottertail, mm -hmm. who is from Lacroix and who lived many years back and forth to St. Norbert um, and who worked on our farm many years in a row. Um, and he told me of these horses repeatedly over about a 10 year period. And so I knew of them and I knew how important they were. Um, so, so that's why when it came up in sudden notice, I, I just had a sinking feeling that uh, that we'd better take action and we'd better make sure that we were the ones to step up to the plate that day so and you have three living we now we have three young mares um and they came to There's us they're fuzzy butts right there <laughs> <laughs> yes they are darling actually definitely become members of our family um when we first got them we thought we might find other homes or the right right place we were open to whatever the right situation was but as it came to pass, we realized that we had the wherewithal and we needed to become part of the active group of breeding them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's the harder part, is, yeah. is how to then manage them to bring them out of this, this critical stage. And so it's, uh, it's been a real joy and pleasure to watch that evolve. Mm -hmm. And we will be part of that group very soon because... <clears throat> yes, and that's what I was gonna... So you are, you're a horse person. First of all, yes. tell us, before we get to the, breed, the breeding part, because that is a little more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, what uh, are they, how are they compared to other horses and ponies that you have on your farm? Do they have a different personality? Yes, they do. They're very, um, they're very unique. And, you know, they're just the sweetest and interesting, curious, um, just a very, very docile but energetic horse. Mm -hmm. So we have different, many, a number of different kinds. And over the years, we've, we've learned about different kinds of horses too. So, you know, each breed has their, their characteristics. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the Ojibwe's are, are just very, um, very special. And I, uh, you know, we've just started training them because they're young. Mm -hmm. So I look forward to getting to know them more and more as we get through this process because it's a relationship. You know, they came yeah. to us almost wild. And so over the two years, they've be, they, their real selves have really uh, shone through. And uh, it's been quite, uh, quite wonderful. And by next, this time next year, you may have six. Well, so we got them when they were two and three years old. Now they are four and five years old. And um, so, you know, they're just on the cusp of being mature enough to become pregnant, mm -hmm. uh, especially the five-year-old is, is definitely. Um, we're watching her carefully because she has some genetic uh, deformity in mm. one of her hooves. So we've x-rayed that and we're thinking about how we can breed that. Uh, the other two younger ones, they're probably still too young, though we'll see how they mature through this winter. But, um, and then it's the question of how to find a stallion. <laughs> yes. Well, we are going to keep following this with you because yes. we, want to, we want to be along the journey with you. Okay. Uh, so, and thank you for taking the time to come and join us in studio today You're to talk with welcome. them. But we will be, uh, we'll be bringing our audience updates. Uh, so there's a number of things that you can do this holiday season to make it a little bit brighter th for others. But in the spirit of giving, uh, there's some people who do it all year long, imagine. Uh, there's a group of volunteers from across the country who are doing good deeds for women and they're looking for help from us, Santa's elves, for a little extra help. APTN's Priscilla Wolf caught up with the director of Moontime Sisters, Nicole White, in Saskatoon. Nicole, what is Moontime Sisters? 
We started in January 2017 after I read an article that young girls were missing school because they didn't have access to menstrual products. So it originally started to be a small group of women who uh, gathered together to send menstrual products to northern communities and then we've just snowballed from there. And then what are some of the, I guess, the products that go into these packages? Mm -hmm. So we specifically focus on menstrual products, so it's mostly tampons and pads, and then if the community asks for them, we can also provide cloth pads and menstrual cups. With Christmas coming up, what can people do to help you with this project that you're working on? Oh gosh, we would love donations. So donations come in all forms, so people can donate online. If they go to the True North Aid website, they can donate cash, or you can go to our Amazon wish list and send product to us directly. And then also you can do a collection drive in your school, in your faith community, or workplace. Now, I understand this is not just here at Saskatchewan. This is something that's happening across Canada. Yeah, so we've been able to mentor a chapter opening up in Ontario in the last few years, and they're doing incredible work. And if any of your audience members are interested in bringing Moon Time to their province, I'm happy to talk to them. And then right now, do you know how many communities that you're reaching out to? Mm -hmm. So we've sent nearly 300,000 products to over 25 northern communities in the last three years. That's a lot. I'm really proud and really it's sort of, um, you can tell it, it reaches people in a really meaningful way and we always talk about food equity and food costs being so huge in the north but the same thing happens with menstrual products. So something that could cost $6 in Saskatoon could be $25 in a northern community so we want to take away that barrier for young girls and know that they're supported and we believe in, in them succeeding in their education. And the quality as well, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and also recognizing that you know menstrual cups are great because it's reusable, but not everybody can use them because we talk about water quality on reserves sometimes not being great. So recognizing that we have to provide the full spectrum of options so young girls get what they need. Well, it was a great idea to help the, the people in the north, and um, thank you so much. Thank you. You can help Moon Time Sisters help young women by visiting their website, truenorthaid.ca. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, touching tributes to loved ones who have moved on to the spirit world and a performance by Murray Porter. Stay with us. Join our conversation now. Call in toll-free at 1-877-647-2786. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page. Follow or tweet us at APTN In Focus. And send your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca. Another from our It's a Christmas Miracle file, a Saguenay First Nation beater saw her handiwork on a major U.S. talk show earlier this week. There was Whoopi Goldberg of The View donning a red dress medallion that Mish Daniels made. Seeing a high-profile American wearing the piece and talking about missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls generated much buzz on social media. Here's what Whoopi said on The View earlier this week. Uh, people have been asking me about the necklace I'm wearing. It it's represents, beautiful. thank you, all indigenous women who went missing on the highway of tears. All the women who've gone missing in this country as well. One of the things that we always talk about is we say, well, you know, the press doesn't really pay attention when little black girls go missing or when, you know, little brown girls go missing. Well, if you think they don't pay attention then, yeah. be Native American. The Native American and Indigenous people find themselves out looking for their people who have gone missing. Mm -hmm. They do this themselves. So this is it's representative. A it's a huge yeah. number. Yeah. And there's an extraordinary book called The Highway of Tears, which I would recommend to you, because I think women need to come together and say, none of us should be gone missing. There has to be a way for all of us to do this better and look out for each other. It's not... You know, it can't be white women saying, well, we don't want to do this. It can't be black women saying, well, nobody's looking for us. It has to be all women saying, damn it, none of us should be going missing at all. Yeah. None of us should be missing at all. You know? So this is my plea. Find out more about this. Because if they can take one of us, mm -hmm. they can take any of us. Mm -hmm. 
We've got Mish Daniels on the line. Mish, who made that uh, medallion that you saw Whoopi Goldberg wearing. Mish, that has got to be surreal to see your beadwork on The View. Hi there. Yes. Oh, goodness. You ca I, I couldn't believe it. I, I lost my voice. I was jumping up and down. I was, I was at home. Well, Connie, Connie sent me a, the picture, but we didn't expect for her to wear it on Monday. And I, oh, I, I just couldn't believe it. So you had say, explain to us how, how this came to be in Whoopi's hands. Well, what happened was, um, how I got a hold of it was Connie. Connie Gray Eyes is, a, 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 she works for um, Missing and Murdered Women in the BC region. She's from Fort St. John, BC, and she inboxed me. She's she seen one of my uh, jingle dress medallions on an actual jingle dress dancer from BC, Juanita. And she asked Wayne Nita you know, where she got it, and then Connie messaged me, and she explained to me she works for missing and murdered women. So I thought, oh, I better make it nice because she's oh. going to be advocating, talking in big crowds. But I didn't think it would be this big of a crowd. <laughs> and then what happened? Connie and her group were at a downtown Vancouver hotel. Whoopi was in the same hotel. Whoopi smelled the smudge. You know how we all smudge before we of we gather, right? Yep. Whoopi smelled it, and little did they know that they both, Whoopi wants to raise awareness for missing and murdered people on the American side. Connie does it for the Canadian side. They connected, they networked, they're going to work, you know, who knows what's going to happen. But you know that old custom we have when you admire, this is what Connie told me, when her and Con, uh, Whoopi were uh, co talking, and, you know, networking, Whoopi kept looking at Connie's feet, like her medallion. You know the old, you know how it goes. The yeah. old protocol. When somebody admires your stuff, you have to give it you away, give it right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's what that good woman Connie oh. did. She practiced that old tradition. She gifted it to Whoopi, and now look at it. And you know what? I'm, I'm gifting Connie back another one for this. Of course you are. I'm so I'm so grateful. My phone, my social media, everything all positive. I, I thank everybody so much. And don't my baby look so beautiful on TV. I don't have children. I'm single. I with no husband or kids, but I call my be my baby. That's mm. why, you know, I say my baby looks good on TV. Yeah, your millions upon millions of people have seen your babies now. What do you think will be is is there a, a takeaway from all of this from this, you know, moment of fame? You know what? Um, I started beating when I was 13. I'm 40 plus now. I won't reveal what the plus is. But <laughs> and you know what? My mom, my mom and my aunties taught us. They're, they're, my cuckoos taught them, and it was supposed to be a hobby. But I, I'm going to be busy for a while now, and it's my passion. I enjoy it. That's why it doesn't take me long. My family are all powerful people. Mm. My niece was the very first one to inspire me. She dances traditional. I wanted to give, give her a gift, you know, of herself, you know, how, how she looked and mm. they just took off since then. But now they're just out of it, like, oh my goodness. But I'm so, so grateful. I'm appreciative. I'm thankful. I just can't believe it. Every time I see Whoopi or anything about it, it just, it could be sentimental, but I get the clamps in, you know, emotional. Because even in my own personal life right now in Winnipeg, two of my young cousins are part of the murdered missing girls, uh, mm. Leanne and um, Nicole Daniel. So you see what I mean? You see how it all connects? And another thing, too, I, I know I'm, I'm yappy, but no. you can't forget <laughs> the boys, the boys and the men. Yeah. You know, my grandpa always said equal balance, right? Yes, a lot of girls go missing, but let's not forget the boys and the men. And, you know, it doesn't matter what color skin, we're all human beings. And at this time, you know, it's all family time soon. Mm -hmm. You know, we all need to be very appreciative of our loved ones that are with yeah. us together. Because this Christmas, many murdered and missing people are going to be without their loved ones. And that's very hard because family is number one, no matter where you come from in indigenous country. Mm -hmm. Family's number one, so you know, and we're all we are interly related somehow. I I don't want to keep going long winded. I know you guys have a uh, time block, but I just want to say thank you very very much, guys. I just can't believe it. 
I appreciate it. I can't believe my little fingers are uh, living. My work is living in New York City, baby. It's so good. Thank you so much, Mish. Merry Christmas to you. And I, I appreciate everything that you had to say. It really puts it in perspective. Um, and it's, yeah, there's a lot to to uh, remember this Christmas. We've got another lady uh, I saw in a newscast earlier this month, something that caught my eye. Uh, the family of a young Mi'kmaq woman who was found dead in her home, they had been gifted um, red dress Christmas tree ornaments uh, to Emma Stevens, a young Mi'kmaq singer who wears dresses. She performs um, every time that she wears these. With the help of APTN's uh, Halifax reporter, Angel Moore, we tracked down the woman who makes these ornaments. Uh, her name is Sylvia Gould. She's a crafter from the Wicoba First Nation in Nova Scotia. We got to talk to her about why she does this and uh, take a look. I, uh, I, I, I made them and then I put them on Facebook and that's where it took off. And then people are now ordering them. I'm just making three of them now. And what, what made you have this idea to, to make these beautiful ornaments? To, to, to really to, to, to bring attention uh, that they're not for, for forgotten at Christmas time and, and, and through any other celebration of their life. Aww. You look at that skirt, you look at that red dress and you think, yes, she's here with me. She sells, Sylvia Gould sells those uh, red dress ornaments on her Facebook page, Sylvia M. Gould. They're $17 each or three for $45. Many of us have traditions that are passed down through generations. For Seguin's Darlene Amo, that tradition is a labor of love. Her grandmother and her mother's Christmas pudding. And it's no easy feat to make it. It involves uh, lots of steps, boiling the ingredients in a bag for three hours. She makes many, many batches to give as gifts and has passed down the recipe and process to her own daughter. Here's Darlene with more on this touching tribute to her loved ones. Well, it's a very personal story for me and really close to my heart. Uh, I feel really blessed you know, to have uh, this teaching from my grandma and my mom mm. because it's all about the love that they had for their family. You know, it's it was handed down from my grandma to my mom and now to me, and now I'm trying to teach my daughter mm. how to make it. Yeah, it's a, it's a Christmas bread pudding, uh, you know, and it takes a lot of, uh, a lot of love and a lot of, uh, I put a lot of energy into making uh, just one batch. And uh, the process takes about, after they're mixed and everything, it takes about three hours to boil on the stove, steam, steam cooked. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something here, there, you'll see the pot there, like my mom's pot. It's about, <clears throat> well, my mom passed in 89, and then uh, she had that pot, oh, I'd say about 10, 10 years or more before she passed on, and I still have it. It's never been washed in, in with soap or anything, and... Every year when I make my batches, I, I use that pot, and uh, it just seems to get better every year <laughs> with the aroma, you know? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's so nice. It's so beautiful. It's um, it's just something really special for me uh, because my grandma, you know, Agnes Fontaine, she's passed now, and uh, my, mom, my mom passed in 89, and uh, I was... You know, I was taught by them. I used to see them make them when I was growing up. Yeah. And I knew how much it meant to them, especially my grandma. Like, you know, she'd make them for all her kids. She had nine kids. And, mm -hmm. like, she was a single mom after my grandpa died. And um, she just kept on and would make sure everyone got a piece of pudding. Like, you know, she'd make each one for them. And then she would do this big shopping for Christmas and make sure every everybody had a gift like her her sons, her daughters, her grandchildren. Mm. It's just so beautiful, you know, like just really cherished memories. Thanks so much to Darlene for sharing that story with us. And it was so kind of her to send some of that Christmas pudding here too. Here's In Focus producer Beverly Andrews and I pausing briefly for a photo before finishing it all up. Thank you, Darlene. It was very similar tasting to my grandmother's Christmas pudding, in fact, but uh, we used to eat ours with brown sugar sauce and whipped cream on it. So what is the time of year without some music? We've got a special treat for you now, thanks to APTN's Tina House,
Tanse, and welcome to In Focus. Joining me here today is my longtime friend, Murray Porter. Murray, <laughs> thank you for joining us today. That's cool, T. Thank you. Hey, it's awesome. You know, we've been friends a long time, and it's really nice to be able to sit down with you and uh, talk with you a little bit about your music. Well, Tell us, what have you been up to? Well, I've been, uh, in the last week or so, I've been to Montreal, uh, Winnipeg, Vancouver, and to the Upper Nicola Band up near Kamloops. Wow, that's amazing, and performing the whole way. Yeah, yeah. That's really cool. It was a lot of fun. Got to meet a lot of nice people and uh, play for some uh, really cool cats. Hey, that's awesome. How long have you been performing now, Murray? Well, let me think. 40 years? I'd say, for, yeah, about 40 years. It's been, it's been a long road. And how did you start? Oh, I started out as a, um, I took some guitar lessons, and my sister, had a piano f for to take lessons on. My mom bought a little piano. And uh, so she got frustrated because she would try to play a song and she couldn't get get it right. And then I would go in there after and, and play it without noting, reading the music. And she would get mad, so she quit playing. After that, the piano was mine. That's awesome. <laughs> well, you've certainly dominated with that piano yeah. ever since. Yeah, it's been fun. That's cool. Now, you have a new album. Tell us a little about this new album of yours. Well, the new album's called Stand Up, and I'm tackling uh, issues like uh, suicide prevention, talking about the water, uh, talking about um, Highway 16 and you know, murdered and missing women. And uh, so I just want to, you know, I don't mind playing music, but I, I want to say something with my music. I just don't want it to be la 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 la. I want to say something. Well, certainly Highway 16 does stand out. I mean, when I first heard that album, I was like, wow. There's a lot more rock and roll in this new album as well. Tell mm -hmm. me a little bit about this new well, uh, genre of yours. I, I, I started to do, uh, actually there's a bunch of different genres. There's, uh, uh, there's country, there's blues, there's rock and roll. And, and so uh, I kind of mix it all up. Every song is uh, different. Uh, they don't, no, no two songs sound alike. You know what I mean? Like they're not all formulaic. And so it, uh, it, I'm pretty proud of it. I'm pretty happy. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Now we're going to get you actually performing one of your songs for us today. Yeah. Which one would that be? I'm going to do No More. It's about the struggle of Idle No More and all the different issues that, uh, that plague our people. Wow, that's cool. And what inspired the words to that? I mean, how did you sit down and say, this is what it's going to be all about and this is what I want to hear from it? Well, I just figured that uh, somebody's got to say something, you know. Um, politicians talk, nobody listens. Uh, if I was to stand there on a soapbox and talk about these things, nobody listens. But you put it to music and people like the music, but they come away with the, the message that I'm trying to say. So. Like a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. So, Absolutely. You know? Well, I'm really excited about this new album, and I hope all of our viewers are as well. Murray, how can they actually get a hold of this uh, new album? Of well, you can uh, pick it up on iTunes. You can pick it up on Amazon and uh, through CD Baby. And so any of those platforms, just go ahead and pick it up. and hope you like it because it's really cool. Fantastic. Do you have a uh, holiday greetings for our viewers out there that are watching today? Yes. Have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Ho, ho, ho. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we'll see you on set here a little bit right, performing then. a new song. Thank you very much. And joining us here at our Vancouver studios is Juno Award winner, Murray Porter. Murray, take it away.
they find riches under the ground. Forget the treaties when money's round. Dig up the bones and break the land. This is more than we can stand. We will not be idle anymore. We will not be idle anymore. Time has come. say it's time to let it go but this is our land we won't be idle anymore they came and took children away taught us their words taught us to Savior, have you been? Say you're solid, then that's the end. We will not be idle anymore. We will not be idle anymore. We will not be idle anymore. be anymore. Well, I'm going to do a Christmas song for everybody. I want to wish everybody out there happy Christmas and Merry New Year. I'm always backwards when I talk. This is a song called Jingle Bells. Jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one horse open sleigh, dashing through the snow on a one horse open sleigh. Thank you so much, APTN's Tina House and Murray Porter. I was just saying to the crew when we were watching that, I would watch a, a show uh, from Tina House if she had an arts and entertainment talk show. You can pick up Murray's uh, new album, Stand Up, at CD Baby, the iTunes Store, Apple Music, and Amazon Music. Oh, we guys take another break. We're running out of time in this block. So we want to hear from you, though. If you've got a Christmas wish for a loved one, you have something to say to Santa. He is watching the show. Call us, 1-800 or 1-877-647-2786. It's free. Stay with us. Welcome back. 2019 was a busy year for one of the elves who works here with us at APTN News. 
Jesse Andreshko is APTN's social media editor, and he joins us now with a look back on some of the biggest videos online. Uh, so thanks, Melissa. So yeah, we post a lot of videos on APTN News Facebook and Twitter pages over the year, and some just take off. Yeah. Um, here is a video from last summer, the Canadian anthem sung in Cree. Yes. 16-year-old Kaya Bruno from Attawapiskat sang the anthem at a Blue Jays game in front of a th thousands of people. Then she had the opportunity to throw the first pitch. Let's take a look. Love it. Now, please welcome Kaya Bruno from Samson Cree Nation in Muspachese, Alberta, who will perform the Canadian anthem in Cree and English. As well as some great comments, uh, like from B, B saying, uh, wow, that made me tear up, feeling very proud of both ladies. Uh, me lit to say this was a, a really awesome moment. That was, and that song, I can't even tell you how many times we played it here in the newsroom, oh, hey? Yeah. It yeah, was just it on a loop, really over and over sure, yeah. and over. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, another video from early January of this year, uh, Ziguan from Wasoxing showed his hidden talent and played an incredible rendition of Hallelujah at youth camp in Muskoka. Muskoka. Uh, let's take a look at that. So she was, because it said Samson. So uh, this video had over 400,000 views and around 8,000 shares. Uh, also had tons of great comments, including Monica, who said, give this kid a proper stu studio to play in. And Rita said, I never get tired of listening to this young, young man singing. He has a very unique voice. Um, this one, I, I know I listen to this one a lot, actually. It's, yes, that was beautiful as really well. Uh, and we just wanted to correct that was uh, the Cree anthem sung in uh, sung in Cree at the baseball game. That was Kaya Bruno from the Samson Cree Nation. Oh. Yes. So the and uh, tell us a little the one that we just saw. How many hits shares? That one had uh, over four hundred thousand views, um, which is great. So we need to circle back and find out what he's up to. Yes, we should. When was absolutely. that? When did you say that that, that was? That was from early January of this year. So that was, it was a year a, ago. It was almost a year ago. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, we got to circle back with him absolutely. on that. Absolutely. Uh, lastly, so this this one keeps coming up. It's one of the biggest videos on our social media. Um, it actually, it's not from this year. It's from 2018. No. But it keeps coming up to the top of the list. Um, Two-year-old Albert, who loves to sing and dance, made a big impact on National Indigenous Peoples Day in Camrose, Alberta. He finally got his first opportunity to dance in front of a big crowd. Take a look at this one. So this video has over 32 million views and well over 60,000 comments. Like it, uh, this would, this is for sure viral. For and us. this is so this was from 2018, as you said. Yes. But it's still being shared yeah, and commented on. Yeah, the list on, of like, like the, the still the biggest the thing top, for 2019. Exactly. Yeah. When you look at the the list of like the top videos, this one is still beating a lot of them. Like it's it's way up there. Um, I feel like we need to go and do a follow up with with the, our tiny dancer Absolutely. and um, our, our, what was the song he was singing? Our music, our piano guy. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this video, it, it was so popular. One comment just kind of shows how popular it was, um, how viral I should say. Uh, he says, uh, what a great dancer and all blessings to him and his family, even half a planet away, he touched mm. hearts. So. Pretty, uh, That's pretty, pretty amazing. Cool. Well, I yeah. wonder how that video will still be hopefully shared in 2020, Absolutely, too, as we get in the yeah. new year. So we have a Christmas message. Yes. Uh, we have a Christmas message from Safi House, <laughs> who is our cat... Safi House. Who is our, yeah, exactly. <laughs> cat correspondent in Vancouver. He wanted to say 
Meowy Christmas, everyone, from Safi House. He wants to wish all his furry friends out there and even there and even all the humans a very happy holiday, good health, and lots of love. Very cute. I love it. What are you doing for Christmas? Um, hopefully, hopefully nothing. Actually, oh, before we go. Yeah. Um, someone actually commented. So we were asking on our Facebook Live um, just to share any messages. From Blair, he says, I'd like to wish all my friends and f my family and friends on the Peavine Metis Settlement in Alberta a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Thanks, Jesse. Man. Thank you, Blair. That is all the time we have for spreading joy this holiday at In Focus. <laughs> have a safe and happy time over Christmas or over solstice, whatever it is that you observe at this time of year. And a shout out to all of our In Focus team who work hard every, every week to bring us this show. I'm Melissa Ridgen, and we'll see you back here on January 8th.